Come on, church, give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Come on, church, let's wait on him just a second.
Come on, church. Come on, church. Let's hear the word of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. As Pastor Mike tells us frequently, we are a church that believes in the spiritual gifts and the tongues and the interpretation. This morning, we believe that, the God, that God has spoken to us and that he's calling his army together. How many knows that we're in the last days? We're in the last hour. We're in the last moments. Amen. If there's ever a time for the, the armies of God to rise up, today is that day. Amen. The word of the Lord is to us this morning. If you're feeling distance from the Lord, if you're not feeling like you're, you're in that army this morning, now's the time. Listen, we want to move while the, the waters are troubled, while the waters are stirred this morning. Amen. I feel his presence here this morning. I don't, I don't want to rush this. I'm not going to. I'm not going to just start preaching because it's time to start preaching, but I'm going to ask if you feel compelled to come to the altar this morning, please come. Please come. Listen, there's an army rising up. Come on, worship team, start singing again. There's an army rising up. We want you to be in that army. We want you to be a part of this army that God's calling in this last hour. There's a great need, amen. There's a great battle that's going on, church. If you're not aware of it, there's a spiritual battle going on. It's happening in high places, and God needs his army to respond, to react. Right now, this morning, will you come? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, God, sing Just be- 
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How many knows we serve a mighty God? Come on, church. I said we serve a mighty God. I so appreciate Phil's testimony and acknowledging how great and how vast, how immense our God is. He's our king, amen. He's our king, church. He's, he's our leader, amen. He's, he's the one who goes before us. Praise God. He's the one that goes before. He's the one whose train fills the temple, amen. How many knows whenever you're talking about the train of a king, you're talking about all of those things that that king has conquered, amen. There's nothing that Christ did not conquer on Calvary's hill, amen, upon the cross. When Jesus was on the cross, Friend, I'm telling you today, it was conquered. It was defeated. He took the keys of uh, a death, hell, and the grave. Amen. He went down to the center of the earth. Amen. He overcame everything that opposed us, everything that came against us, everything that stood against us, all sin, everything that, that could have possibly hindered our relationship with God, Jesus Christ, our King. I said he, he, he conquered it on Calvary's hill. Amen. His train, his long train is just a resemblance of the things that he's conquered. Amen. Throughout uh, uh, the, the ages of time, praise God, that he's made us to be victorious because of his overcoming. Will you give him a hand clap of praise this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. The Bible says that my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of kings and lord of lords. That's my king. And I'm wondering today, do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. There's no means of measure that can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled, he's unprecedented. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. And he's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. Does anybody know him? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Does anybody know him? He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. And I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hand. You can't outlive him. And friend, you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave could not hold him. That's my king. I wonder today, do you know him? The Bible says, in Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's our Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In 
Deuteronomy, he's a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In 1st, 2nd Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In the Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's a rebuilder of broken down walls in human life. In Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, he's our day spring on high and our everlasting redeemer. In Psalms, he is the Lord our shepherd. In Proverbs, in Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he's our lover and bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the righteous branch. In Lamentation, he's a weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's a wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, he is the fourth man in the fire. In Hosea, he's a faithful husband who's forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he's a baptizer of Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's a mighty to save. In Jonah, he's a great foreign missionary. In Micah, he's a messenger of beautiful feet. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he's God's evangelist crying, revive thy works in the midst of the year. In Zephaniah, he's a savior. In Haggai, he's a restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he's a fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanliness. In Malachi, he's a son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Does anybody know him? That's my king. The Bible says in Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, he's a wonder worker. Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he is the Holy Ghost. In Romans, he's our justifier. In the Corinthians, he's our sanctifier. In Galatians, he's a redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he's the God that supplies our every need. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In the Thessalonians, he's our soon coming king. In the Timothys, he's our mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's our faithful pastor and friend. In Philemon, he's the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he is the great physician. In 1st, 2nd Peter, he's our chief shepherd who soon shall appear with a crown of unfading glory. In 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he's love. In June, he's the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. In Revelation, he's still the king of kings. He's still the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder today, do you know him? I want to let you know the Bible says he's able sacrifice. He's Noah's rainbow. He's Abraham's ram, Isaac's wells, and Jacob's ladders. He's Issachar's burdens, and Judah's scepter. He's Balaam's shallow, Moses' rod, and Elijah's mantle. He's Elisha's staff, and Gideon's fleece. He's Samuel's horn of oil. He's David's slingshot. He's Isaiah's fig poultice. He's Hezekiah's sundial. He's Peter's shadow. He's Paul's aprons and handkerchiefs. He's Stephen's signs and wonders, and John's pearly white city. He's the husband to the widow, and the father to the orphan. He's a bright and morning star. He's a lily of the valley. He's a beautiful rose of Sharon. He's a staff of Life. He's honey in the rock. He's a rock in the weary land. And he's the pearl of great price. And the government of our lives does rest upon his shoulders. He's Jesus of Nazareth. He's the son of the living God. That's my king. And I wonder today, do you know him? <laughs> Come on, church. Give him a hand clap of praise today. Let him know you love him. Hallelujah. take just a few moments this morning to share with you what God's put on my heart. You know what, I, I want to take just a second and I want, I want you to, to acknowledge and to recognize how God has so powerfully been moving in our services. Will you please acknowledge that? Will you please, will you please acknowledge that, 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 that it's, not, it's not Pastor Mike, it's not Pastor Ed, it's not Pastor, it's not it's not any, it's the only, the only one who deserves glory is God. Yeah. Amen. The only one who deserves glory is God. It's not because of our programs. It's not because of our Sunday school service. not because of, 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 of the preaching or the worship. All of that stuff's wonderful and great. But the only reason that we're enjoying the services that we've been enjoying is because of his presence. Because of his presence. Amen. And you and I, I, I want you to understand it's not time to slack off. It's not time to back up and say, well, we can just put it on cruise control now. I mean, God's going to show up. No, God showing up does depend on you, and it depends on me. And all of us have a responsibility to come together as a single unit. Listen, on the day of Pentecost, <laughs> amen, we, we, we preach it a lot around here. We're a spirit-filled church, Amen. A, a spirit-led church, and we, we believe in, in allowing the spirit to have his way in our services. And the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, 
They were all gathered in the upper room in one mind and one accord. There was one unit, amen, up there praying and seeking God. You know what they were after? They were after one thing, friend, and the only thing they were after was the presence of God. They wanted the presence of God, amen. And you and I have to have that same tenacity. You and I have to have that same desire and passion within us, with us to desire only one thing and one thing only, and it's the desire of God to be in the presence of our King, to be in the presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if we're here for any other reason than that, it's wrong. It's wrong, amen. Life is full of victories, and life is full of defeats. I don't know if you, if you uh, watched uh, 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 CBS and, and NBC and ABC years ago before all the, the cable and uh, satellite networks came uh, into play, but uh, the sports channels would, would always open up, especially in the, uh, like the winter games or whatever, you know, and they showed these uh, uh, pictures of people coming off these ski slopes and, and you know, they're soaring high and it was, it was the... Uh, uh, Thrill of the victory, amen. How many remembers that? The thrill of the victory and the agony of the defeat, amen. <laughs> Next picture you see they're crumbling up and, and, and wrecking and, and oh my goodness, it's just a travesty. And you know, such is, such is life. Life is like that we have uh, victories in our lives where we uh, feel like we're on top of the mountain and then there are times when we have great defeats in our life, amen. And so I wanna read this passage of scripture to you I mean, believe it's important to read the Bible when you come to church. Amen. So I want us to look in the Word today and apply this to our, our life, to our current, current uh, situations. It's found in Joshua chapter 7. <clears throat> Brother Mike told me he was going to be out all day today. I was initially going to just uh, speak tonight, and then he was going to be out. So uh, he asked me to speak this morning, and... Please come back tonight. My son's going to be uh, speaking. I'm really looking forward to hearing what God has to say through him. Justin is, is very anointed, and, and believe me, whenever he speaks, uh, it's because he's heard from the Lord, and I, I'm anticipating to hear that. And in, in asking God what to, to speak to you today, this, what I've already shared with you is, is what just came flooding into me, how we have been so graced with the presence of God, how we've been so uh, uh, just blessed to have God's, God's presence and, and the manifested presence of God in our services. And we've been having people get saved, amen. We've been having people get filled, amen. I, I believe people are getting healed in our services and there's deliverances that are, that are taking place. I believe families are being restored. Listen to me, I don't, even, if, even if you're not seeing this in the natural right away, I want you to believe still that it's happening. It's come, because listen, when, when, when his presence is in the house, amen, all of those things can't help but happen, amen. Healing has to happen in the presence of Jesus, amen. Restoration has to happen in the presence of Jesus. Deliverance has to happen in the presence of Jesus. Salvation will happen in the presence of Jesus. Whenever Jesus is in the house, amen, all of these things will culminate for us and we will have blessings and we will have favor in our life as long as God gets the glory. As long as God gets the glory. And so I, as I'm thinking about that, I, I want us I want to caution us today. Today's message is, is uh, I guess, if, if it's anything, it's a word of caution. And I, I want us to be very careful in, in our uh, 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 approach to coming to this house and, and coming into uh, the service and, and just, just, just taking for granted, if you will, the things that, that, that go on here. How many, how many believes it's important that you and I prepare ourselves before we come to the house of God? I posted a little thing on Facebook, and I, I, I saw it, so I, I shared it, what I did. But it, it said something to this effect. It is impossible for you to come and worship on Sunday only. It is impossible for you to come to church and worship on Sunday only. If you're not worshiping on Monday, you don't really worship on Sunday. If you're not worshiping on Tuesday, you're not really worshiping on Sunday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if you're not worshiping every day of the week, don't come in and act like you're going to be able to raise up your hands and truly worship, amen. He seeks those to worship him in what? Spirit and truth, amen. You're not going to worship him any other way than you worship him in spirit and truth. You can't come in here and put on no show. You can to me and you can to everybody else. I can, I can think, oh, man, that person is, is awesome and they're really holy and, 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 and really, oh, look at them worship. 
But God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart, and he knows if your worship is sincere or not. And if you're just coming in here on Sunday and thinking you're just going to worship on Sunday or you're coming here just to, to be entertained, I want to give you a word of caution today. God's not pleased with that, and God will not always entertain it. God will not always entertain it. I'm telling you, I don't want this church to ever get in a place of complacency where we feel like we are owed this, this presence of God, this manifested presence of God week in and week out. We are not owed anything. God does not owe us anything. We owe him everything. And so I want to let you know today, your life <laughs> Y'all might wish Pastor Mike preached today. Your life and my life matters outside of this little sanctuary. It matters, friend, how you live day in and day out. If you've got sin in your life, you're hindering me. I said, if you've got sin in your life, you're hindering me. If I have sin in my life, hidden sin, I'm hindering you. And you say, oh, it don't matter. It don't matter how I live. My, my life don't affect I'm keeping myself, and whatever I do, that's my business. It ain't none of your business. You're wrong. You're wrong. I'm not trying to pry, and I'm not trying to meddle this morning. I'm not trying to get in nobody's business. But I'm going to tell you this. Your life, the way you live it, matters, and it has a great Tremendous impact on how God manifests himself in these services week in and week out. And that's the bottom line today. I'm going to show you that. Joshua chapter 7. I'm about halfway done, Jonathan. This, of course, is a, a, a division, if you will, chapter 7 from verse, uh, chapter 6. Initially, it's not like this, and I, I like to try to just remind folk that uh, the, all of the chapters and verses and stuff like that's all man stuff. The original writings didn't have all of these breaks and cuts in them, okay? So chapter 7 is not a brand new, fresh idea. This is actually following, coming out of chapter 6, okay, which is true of, of all of the books, all of the writings. They're not, I, I really don't understand why we do all the breakups in them, I guess just for references, but I want you to understand this is not, this is not a new thought here that, that Joshua is, is, is coming, or uh, uh, the writer's coming up with, Joshua. But this is tailing off of chapter 6. And I, just a real quick reminder of what happened in chapter 6 is simply this. They have already come over the River Jordan. The, the Israelites have. They're, they're coming into the promised land. They're coming into a place that God has, has, has promised. How many, how many knows that there is a promised land God has promised you and I? Come on now, I want, to, I want to keep this real, and I want you to not think this is something that happened 4,000 years ago, but this is relevant in 2016 on February the 21st. This is just as relevant, relevant today as it was back then. So they're coming out of Jordan. They've come across, amen. In other words, they've been saved. You and I, whenever we come up out of this world, we saw the light, amen. We heard the word of God, and by faith, we received that word into our hearts, amen. We received uh, Jesus Christ as our king, amen. We, we decided at that moment that we are going to follow him, amen. We crossed over. We crossed from one life into another life, amen. The life, uh, we come out of darkness, the Bible says, into his marvelous light. We have crossed over. So we're coming into our promised land. I mean, he's hearing me. And we've got some things that we've got to steal, even though we've come into the promise, there's still some obstacles that we've got to go through. There's still some places, some hard places, that you and I are going to have to go through. Just because if anybody told you, I know you've heard this a million times, but if anybody ever told you that when you get saved, all of life is rosy and, and you have no more problems and it's just a, 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 a vanilla ice cream and, 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 and chocolate syrup the rest of your day, you, you don't have anything else to worry about. You were lied to, and I'm sorry you were lied to, but you were lied to. It's not easy after you get saved. Listen, the devil doesn't have to hinder and, 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 and those folk are already, they've they beaten themselves up bad enough. <laughs> if, they, if they haven't crossed over, listen, that's what happened to them all out in the wilderness. The reason they couldn't cross over because they were, they were mumbling and griping and complaining. Come on, does that sound familiar? Y'all don't shut me down. Because, because I, I know I'm, I'm reading our mail. 
I'm reading our mouth. Because listen, we're guilty of doing the same things they were. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute too. But this is coming off of chapter 6 where they've gone in. Listen, they got it right. They heard the word of the Lord. And God told Joshua to, uh, to assemble the Israelites and for uh, seven priests to, to blow seven trumpets. And they were to march around the walls of Jericho so many times. And then on the last day so many times. And they were to give out a tremendous shout. And as they did that, the walls of Jericho, these impenetrable walls that nobody could ever uh, uh, overcome, would fall down and they would be able to go in and take the city and it would be a mighty victory for them. How many knows that's exactly how it played out in chapter 6? <laughs> Woo! Man, they're feeling good. Just like Paul and Assembly is feeling good because, listen, the Holy Ghost has been coming. Amen. He's been giving us victories in our services. He's been helping us to overcome. He's been saving people. Amen. He's been restoring families. People are getting delivered. Amen. People are getting healed. Listen, some mighty victories are happening because we have been obedient, amen, to the Word of God. Now, chapter 7. <laughs> Y'all ready? Everybody say, but. That's an that's a ugly three-letter word, <laughs> in this instance anyway. It's a conjunction. I'm going I'm to read the very last verse in chapter 6. Watch this. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. How many of folk are talking about Poe and Assembly of God? Uh, they are. I, I, I hear it. People are telling me stories of, of, of people that's telling them stories of, that don't come here. That this, man, I hear some awesome things are going on at Poe. Here's some awesome things. I hear y'all have some church. Uh, Brother Mike said a week or so ago, he and I have a mutual friend. He calls me, lives in Mississippi. Man, I've been hearing y'all having some church. <laughs> Amen. So, so the fame <laughs> of, of, of Poe and Assembly has been noised throughout all the land. Watch this. Chapter 7, very first word, but, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now let me, let me, let me explain to you what, what, what's, what's, what's happened here. God gave them a tremendous victory over Jericho. And there's this little word called a ban, B-A-N, that God has put over Jericho, which means it is to be utterly destroyed. The word, the definition of, of, of ban is to utterly destroy, completely. And every living thing must die. And every spoil... Every piece of gold, silver, precious metal, precious stone, whatever, all of that was to, was to go specifically towards the treasure and glory of God. The Israelites were not to touch it. They were not to keep it. They were to utterly destroy it. Listen, this is, this is an example of what happens whenever we come to the Lord. Amen. We come to the Lord and we, we ask God to forgive us of our sins. Amen. And we apply that blood that he shed on Calvary's cross to our sin. I want you to know at that very point, he utterly destroys all sin in your life. Everything is gone. You are white. You are washed white. I know we hear it all the time. I get on my soapbox every time I get in front of you. I'm going to do it again right now. And people say you can't be perfect. But I'm going to tell you something. Whenever you get saved and you truly repent of your sins and you ask God to forgive you and to come into your heart, Friend, at that moment, you are perfect. You are washed white. There is no sin in you. There is no black. You are without spot. You are without wrinkle. You are perfect. You are a perfect son or, or daughter of the Lord at that moment. Not even one amen. That's okay. That's okay because it's true. Jesus said this, or, or, or John said this through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in 1 John 1, 9. He said if we're faithful to confess our sins to him or our faults to him, he's faithful. Come on. He's faithful and what? Just, justified to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If you are forgiven of all your sins and you are cleansed from all unrighteousness, how much sin and how much unrighteousness do you have? Zero. You are white, clean, and perfect. Thank you. Praise God, I got two amen. Listen, in the Bible, Jesus himself instructs us in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, I think it's verse 48, he says, be ye therefore perfect. And we've been drilled this, I can't be perfect, nobody's perfect, and we're not perfect. And I understand the point of that, I really do. But that mindset will get you in a lot of trouble because if you think that it's impossible for you to be perfect, you won't ever try to live perfect. And when God says you can and he calls you to do it, it's because we can and because we're able to do it. Amen? All right, here we go. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of all of these guys, took the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Now, people often think that because, uh, you know, God commanded, how many knows this was, this was a theocracy? And really all that means is it, it, was, it, was, it was governed or ruled specifically by God. I like preaching to these guys. I want you to know, Kristen, that, that God's on your side. Huh? Amber, God's for you. God wants you to know that he's with you. That, listen, this is, not, this is not something that you, you, you think you're, you're blessed and you think you're holy and righteous because of what you do. You're not. The only reason you're holy and the only reason you're right, the only reason any of us, are holy and righteous is because of what he's done and, and because of our faith in him. Listen, a theocracy means it is God ruled. It is God governed. Amen. This attack on Judah, these people were Canaanites and they were the lowest form, the most basest form of depravity as you could imagine. They sacrificed children to idols and to gods. And God said, I have been patient with them for over 400 years, and now in order for you to come in and obtain the, uh, the, the promised land that I have already given to you, you're going to have to go in and defeat them. And it looks like it's undefeatable. It looks like it's just impossible to penetrate these walls that are standing up that nobody in, a, in, in the world's history has ever been able to get, to get into but God said, if you'll, if you'll abide by my words, if you'll do what I tell you to do, come on, the impossible will become possible for you. <laughs> you know, I, I love that analogy Brother Mike used last week. Uh, if you were here, he, he was standing up here and he said, you know, uh, our perspective is so skewed because all we can see is what's right here in front of us. Huh? But God's up here and he can see the end from the beginning. Huh? <laughs> Man, that thrilled me. That was worth me combing a few hairs I got and getting up and coming to church that night. Hey, that alone. He said a lot of other good stuff. But that was, that, that, that's so true. Our, our, our view, our perspective is so limited. We can't see the whole picture. And that's why faith is required. You understand that? Huh? You, you can't see. Phil, God bless you, man. He, he's right. he don't even know he was preaching my message this morning. We're so, we're so limited in what we can see. We don't, the vastness of God is so, so great. We, we're, it's, it's just our little finite minds. He said he don't use 100%. I don't use 5% of mine. I, I think the, the, the what, capacity is like 10% maybe. I don't know. But, but the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we can't see the end from the beginning, but God sees it, and God said with him, all things are possible. He said, with man, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So the thing, that, that wall that looks so impenetrable that you cannot get through, God said you're going to be able to get through it if you'll abide by my word. If you'll do what I'm telling you to do. How many wants to see 
signs and wonders and miracles and things like that happen right here in our midst. How many wants to see that? How many really desire to see that? Let me, let me know you desire it. Let me tell you how that's going to happen. That's going to happen only if you abide by his word. So when God comes and allows you to go through a hard place, huh? <laughs> because our view is so limited. And we don't understand the ways of God. And doesn't he tell us that in his word? Doesn't he tell us that my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than? Yes, he does. And so who are we, thank you again, Phil, to question God? And, and why isn't things working out the way I think they ought to, God? Huh? Why am I not being delivered the way I think I ought to be delivered, God? Why is my family not reacting or coming to church like, like I think you ought to be making them, God? Why are my kids acting the way you, you ought, they, they ought to be acting, God? Why am I not getting victory over this thing in my life, God? As if it's God's fault. And we want to blame God. But God said this. This victory that you have, and, and, and let me say this before I say what, 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 what I was going to. Your victory is oftentimes followed by a great defeat. And the reason that is, is because when we come out of a victory, we tend to think, whoo, hey, huh? See that? Huh? See where I'm at? Whoo. Ah. Huh. Ah, oh, yeah, that's better. Yeah, let's get comfortable. Yeah, I, 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 I know I should be praying, but hey, <laughs> man, whoo, I'm on a high. I just, I, just, I just had this great victory in my life. Let's get comfortable. Yeah, I ought to be reading the Bible. I ought, ought, to, ought to be. I'll be praying for my church, but <clears throat> man, God, God's just been so, so mighty and so powerful in our services. Whew. And the next thing you know, the agony of defeat. And we're sitting there looking around like, what in the world just happened? What in the world just happened? So I'm going to tell you, I want to show you here that God wanted... Israel to go in and conquer every inhabitant of the land. Amen. How many, how many, how many is with me? Jericho was this huge obstacle that was in their way, and God, man, just miraculously gave it into their hands. And now they're about to come up against this little old city. It's a royal city. It's called Ai. And before we get to AI, and you, and you think that, that God was so barbaric in, in ordering all of the annihilation of, of, of Canaan, uh, like I said a while ago, their, their sin and depravity had been before them for over 400 years. God had, had uh, asked them uh, to, to turn. They wouldn't turn. So it was judgment. And, and the theocracy comes by God is using Israel to, to pass judgment upon these Canaanites. And not all of them were destroyed. How many knows that, uh, remembers the story about Rahab and, and her family? She turned to God, and because she turned to God and, and said, we acknowledge your God, amen, God spared them and her family, right? That's a gracious God we serve. He's not barbaric. Listen, but if you continue in your sin, listen to me, if you continue in your sin, you just day in and day out, and you think it's all right, nobody knows, it's not hurting anybody, be sure that your sin will find you out. And they went up against this little city of Ai. And listen, Joshua 
took counsel in the, in, in, in the elders, and they said, listen, just send up two or 3,000 of us. Ain't no need all of us going up there. This, listen, they've got confidence, right? They're, they, they, they're, they're building themselves up. And these, these people in Ai, they're, they're of the Amorites now. They're, a, they're an Amorite uh, uh, town, and, and Amorite, the, the, the name of Amorite means it's a, they're a mountainous people, and they are renowned. In other words, they've got a name for themselves, and they're high and elevated. And if we're not careful, as Christians, as, as people of God, we'll do that. We'll get ourselves in a very high place, and we'll think we got a name for ourselves. Anybody hear me? Huh? We got it going on. And we'll think we're higher and better than everybody else, and we'll look down our nose at everybody, and we'll be judgmental and critical of everybody. Amen. That's going to get you in trouble. But the Israelites went against them, sent two or 3,000 men up there, and the Bible said that uh, they killed 36 of them right off the bat and run them out of town. Just like that. Now, they just had this victory over this great, huge city of Jericho that was surrounded by impenetrable walls. God dropped the walls, gave them a, 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 a let them whip their hind ends from one end to the other, run them out, completely annihilated and killed every one of them, and they think that they are invincible now. Now, here's the point of my message today, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap up. But there was sin in the camp. There was sin in the camp. And even though they had gained this great victory over Jericho because of the sin, the blessings and the favor of God left the entire nation of Israel. Are you hearing me today? Are you hearing me today? You think the sin in your life doesn't matter, and you think that it doesn't affect anybody but maybe you, and maybe you've not even felt any judgment over, over, over yourself. But let me tell you something, sir, ma'am, it's coming. Judgment is coming. And as one of your pastors, I want to caution you today, Poe, and Assembly of God, to examine yourself, to please examine yourself. God God is gracious. He would not, have, he would not have, have destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah had there been 10 righteous people in it. He would have spared them. Because the entire city of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah, God spared them. They had judgment coming. Judgment was coming on them. But because they repented, Judgment was withheld. So I want to encourage you today to examine yourself. Achan means trouble. The valley of Achor, which is where him and his family were stoned and burned because of their sin. You know, we oftentimes get this, this, this picture of grace and God in our mind, and, and we paint this, this uh this fantasy about how God is just so nice and, 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 and he doesn't allow anybody to be killed. <laughs> he doesn't allow anybody to be destroyed. And while I, I am probably one of the greatest advocates of grace you will ever be around, I, I, I preach grace, I love grace, I teach grace. I don't do it to the point where anybody ought to feel like they can abuse grace and feel like that you won't be judged because of the grace. If you don't repent, judgment will come. Judgment is inevitable if you don't repent. And crying and boo-hooing and coming to an altar and use an entire box of Kleenexes, it's not repentance. Probably good to help clean stuff out. <laughs> but until you make up your mind to turn away from the sin in your life and go towards God, you have not repented. And I don't care how small of a thing you think it is, your sin affects everybody else in here. The sin of Achan caused Israel to suffer a great defeat. That ban that God had put on uh, Jericho 
for everybody to be annihilated, utterly destroyed. That's the definition, utterly destroyed. And every piece of gold, silver, precious stone, all of that uh, 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 spoil was to go to the treasure of God. Nobody was to keep it. Achan took for himself raiments, gold, silver, and hid it under his tent. God called them out, and Joshua would not stop until the man who was guilty confessed to it. Now, I don't look for Brother Mike to start calling folk out. I hope that never has to happen. But I want you to call yourself out. Come on, Dana, whoever's coming. I want you to call yourself out. And I want you to examine yourself. Because I truly believe that there's a time coming that God wants to use this church to do mighty exploits, to achieve and gain great victories through each individual life, all of our families, and through us as a unit as a whole. You will be judged individually for your sin, but I'm telling you, your sin also has a negative impact on this unit, on this body, just as it did on the children of Israel. They all suffered because of one man's sin. And so I want you to look at yourself today, and I want you to ask yourself today, and and really you don't have to ask, do you? We don't have to ask. We already know. We already know what it is that we deal with. We already know what what, what it is that we struggle with. We already know what the little hidden things in our life are. And when Joshua called them out, judgment fell on Achan, not only on on Achan, but all of his family. You know, I come in here week in and week out. And I don't, I don't, I don't always do a really good job of it, but I, I really try. I really try to communicate union and family here at Poland. I really try to, I really try to get us to understand how it is, how important it is for us to, to view each other as family, because we are, we are the family of God. And I want you to know that I, I, I say this. Frequently, but please don't mistake my frequency as as, as being lighthearted and just having some, something to say. I, I really mean that I love, I really love my church family. And I know I, I will do something if I haven't already, just as Pastor Mike has said, and, and uh, if he hasn't offended you, he will. And if he doesn't do it, I will. But I promise you, I'm not ever gonna do it intentionally. And if I do, please let me know and I'll do everything I can to beg for your forgiveness because it's really not intentional. I'm not trying to intentionally offend anybody. I may I may do it though. I come across that way sometimes. But all of us do. But the point is this, I love you. And I want, I want God to do mighty things here at Poen. I want to see your families, your individual families restored. I want to see God move mightily in your homes. I want to see God move mightily in your kids and, and your, your moms and dads and, and aunts and uncles and cousins and, and, and your, your, your immediate natural family. I want God to do mighty things in your life. And the only way that's going to happen is if you are living holy and you are being righteous. Now, you're saying, Brother Ed, are you tell me i got to be perfect all the time? No, I'm not. It's one thing to have known sin, hidden sin in your life. You know you know this, this defies God's will for your life and yet you continue to do it. That's one thing. But to, to mess up and, 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 and fall from time to time, the only failure in that is if you stay down. If you'll get back up and repent, listen, God will say, what are you, what are you talking about? It's, I, I don't even know what you're talking about. Huh? We're good. But if you live in sin, and, you, and you, you minimize sin, and you think it's no big deal because it's only you. You're the only one that's being, that's a lie. And my, 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 my point or my desire today is to, is to let you know that, 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 that Satan is lying to you because he does not want to see God move mightily in our midst. 
Stand your feet. Man, I'm doing really good. It's only 12 15. Because the sin was dealt with. Israel faced Ai again and utterly destroyed them. Utterly annihilated them. Took them out of the way. Listen, God wants you to overcome every obstacle in your life because he has something better for you. And if you can get this out of the way, then God, yes, there's going to there's gonna come another challenge. There's going to come another obstacle to you. Listen, but if you can get this out of the way, God will increase your faith. He'll increase your confidence in him. And listen, every victory that you incur in your life, friend, I want you to, I want you to, and if you're not intentional about this, I'm telling you, you're, you're asking for the agony of defeat to come into your life. But after every victory, I want you to acknowledge that it's God. God gives me the victory, amen, to overcome. I told you I was going to reference it, and I didn't get a chance to get to it, but I invite you, I encourage you, please go look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and this is what it's going to tell you. Paul's going to tell you that what they did, he's talking about our fathers, in the Old Testament, he said everything they did is an example for you and I. Everything that, that happened to them is an example for you and I. He said whenever they went through the sea, they were all baptized by Moses going through the, uh, under the cloud. That's all an example to us. And I'm telling you, whenever they had this great victory in Jericho, when you and I had the great uh, victory and, and salvation coming into our life, don't think it's okay to sin after that. Don't think it's okay to be disobedient after that. It's not okay. There's an example here that you and I are going to have to follow. And I desire for God to continue to do what he's doing here at Poland which he's growing us. Our family's getting bigger. Can you see it? Our family's getting bigger. We're growing, amen. And I believe God's gonna continually add to us. That's what his intention was for the first century church, to add to the church daily. I want God to add to this church daily. Not for our recognition, for his glory. God, please use me. Please use this church. But I'm declaring right now, Hear me when I say this. I'm declaring right now, there is a band. Are you hearing me? There's a band right here. And it's against sin. Every aspect of it, I don't care how great, how small, I'm declaring a band here today at Poet Assembly of God. We are to ban every ounce of sin out of this place. It has to be completely destroyed, completely annihilated, completely done away with. No sin anywhere in our life. Yeah, come on, give him a hand clap of praise. Listen, that's his orders, not mine. Because God loves us. I'm telling you, I know God loves Poen. He loves every person in here. And all of our... I, I, all of, our, all of our programs and ministries, all of that's wonderful and needed. I believe God is ordaining all of this. I believe God is truly working through the, our pastor to, 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 to bring this vision to, to fruition. All of that's necessary. But none of that's going to help us if we don't get rid of the sin in our life. None of it. So guys, please, if you would, turn down the lights back here. And I'm going to ask everybody in this house, we've got a few minutes, please. I'm going to ask you to come, and let's deal with it. Let's deal with it. I would like to think that everybody here under the sound of my voice is absolutely perfect this morning and that nobody has any sin in their life whatsoever. But the reality of the matter is that's not the case. So I'm inviting you this morning to come. Come this morning. Let's spend a few minutes at the altar. Let's deal with the sin 
Whatever sin we have in our life, I'm telling you, it's got to be done away with. Listen, if, you, if, you, if your reluctance to come down here is because you're afraid of what somebody else is going to think about you, the devil's lying to you. Because if you don't come down here, <laughs> one of two things is going on. Either you really believe you're perfect, or two, you don't really care if God moves in this house or not. I know that won't give me the Sermon of the Year award, but it's true. So right now, if you're in this house and you really want to see a move of God come through this, 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 this church, this, this union, this body of believers, would you come right now? Would you step out of your seats right now? Would you come, please? Thank you. Thank you for coming.